Hello, my name is Catherine Lefebvre. I'm a neurologist in Saratoga Springs, New York, and I have the pleasure today to be talking to Dr. Rita Achari today, who's joining us from Houston, Texas, on the topic of nutritional neurology. So thank you, um, Rita, for joining us. That's right. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for inviting me to do this. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, so in the base of introduction, you have a very, very interesting career. You've been uh, special training undergoing in epilepsy and neuroimaging. Um, you have been in private practice for over 20 years. And uh, one of your special interests has been the field of nutrition and neurology. And why don't you tell us a little bit what, what got you interested in this topic? Sure. Uh, you know, neurologists have always been involved in nutrition. If you look at the first vitamin that was discovered, which is vitamin B1, it's called B1 because it was the first one, um, and deficiency causes beriberi and the symptoms of beriberi uh, can be uh, cognitive issues, so sort of mental fog and peripheral neuropathy. And as you sort of go down the list of other micronutrients and vitamins that have been discovered, the predominant or first manifestations tend to be neurological. So with folic acid and its importance for spinal cord development, um, you know, vitamin B6, and of course, vitamin B12. And we know that deficiencies in these things cause clear neurologic issues, which are treatable. Um, I grew up at a time where uh, we thought food was supplemented and so things should be much better for us. And yet, um, we know that people still have these deficiencies. So um, I think neurologists, as I said, are nutritionists by definition. Uh, we do it so easily and such, as such a known part of our, our lives that we may not actually fully realize how often we're involved in it. Yeah, that is true. And I think especially vitamin B12, we, we do check this quite a bit in different scenarios. But uh, um, yeah, could you give me uh, some other examples from your practice where you maybe came across nutritional deficiencies that are less commonly known or encountered? Sure. Um, what has been interesting for me, and I think probably for all of us who are taking care of patients, is that our diets have changed significantly. And in the modern world, um, people have very specialized and unique diets, and some of them are quite restrictive. Uh, some of them are for health reasons, some of them are for fashionable reasons, but either way, we have, we have lots of different diets now, so people eat differently. Uh, my first patient, actually, who uh, was an attorney um, this is my first case that really got me looking into things in, in much greater detail. So as an attorney who, uh, for a year, uh, or so year had been going to the medical center. I'm in Houston, Texas. I have the great good fortune of having three different medical schools, three different departments of neurology and fabulous neurologists. Um, but he started having brain fog, um, and he just was having trouble keeping track of the things being said in depositions. He would pick up the uh, reading material that he'd seen yesterday and really had a hard time continuing uh, figuring out where did I leave off? So his, his brain wasn't working as sharply as it should have been. And he had this weird numbness and tingling. So he went to uh, our institutions. Everybody did a fabulous job and um, almost everything was done, including you know, spinal taps, nerve biopsies, and nothing could be found. So um, I, I like interesting and strange cases. So he was referred to me and he came in with two banker's boxes full of records. And I thought everybody has seen him. There's no way I'm going to add anything. But, you know, like all good neurologists, we take it all home and we look through it all. Um, and really everything had been done. He, I called him the next morning and I said, have you done anything different? Have you, you know, started welding? Are you in a warehouse? Could it be, you know, some sort of toxin exposure? What, what are we missing here? He said, I haven't done anything different. And um, I put the phone down and a few minutes later, he called me back and he said, Dr. Chari did one thing different. And that was 
six months before all these symptoms started, I started a gluten-free diet. He eliminated all grains, all of them from his diet. Um, and you know, the, a B1 level was done once, uh, during this evaluation and it was just barely within normal range, right? So nobody thought anything of it. The, uh, the thing was he would occasionally cheat. So probably around the time that the level was done, you know, cause it was a waxing lady presentation. Um, anyway, we did his B1 level at that time and it was, again, it was very deficient, um, so I gave him uh, B1 injections, B1 orally, found a good source of, of wheat flour in Utah for him and taught him how to bake bread and put grains, good whole grains, uh, back into his diet um, in appropriate quantities and, uh, you know, made sure he wasn't eating what most of us get in the grocery store, which is added gluten to everything which was making him feel sick. There was a reason he went to this. Once we got him uh, on good whole grains without dough conditioners and added gluten, he was he did very, very well. He recovered fully, went back to practice. For a year, he sent me a loaf of bread uh, once a month. I haven't received that in a while, so I'm sure he's doing well. He doesn't have to think about his neurologist anymore. So that that's my B1 deficiency story. And then, you know, um, 50% of the American public is actually vitamin C deficient, right? That data comes from NHANES, which is the nutritional assessment survey done by the CDC. And those are those measurements are actually serum and uh, good blood level measurement. Um, my next case, so I tell you about vitamin C, a SIEM woman who had um, epilepsy and uh, she 22 year old, and uh, she was convinced that she was getting rash and abdominal pain from her anti-seizure medicine. She was, uh, had been taking the same this whole time. Um, anyway, she came to see me and we went through everything. The generic formulation had not changed. Nothing about anything had changed. And yet she's having this abdominal pain and rash. She also had some joint pain. She had some gum bleeding. There were other things that it, sort of pointed to, you know, scurvy. Um, I didn't know at that time, so this was, you know, about this was about 20 years ago, I didn't know at that time that you could order a vitamin C level. Uh, so I had to call the lab and say, how do I do this? And they ordered the lab, you know, the or she went and got her blood work done. Her level came back and it was zero. And I thought, clearly I have done something wrong, right? <laughs> something has gone wrong here. When I called the lab, the other, the phlebotomists there uh, actually checked their own after the vitamin C level came back as zero. They were low, but they weren't zero. So they said, this is a legitimate thing. And we did repeat her uh, level and it really was zero. So when I asked her, hey, what, what's going on? Well, she graduated from college. She was working at, as a waitress in a, a bar restaurant and she was living by herself and she was only eating canned soup. So you work all night, sleep, get up in the morning and have canned soup. And canned soup doesn't have any vitamin C despite having little, you know, beans and potatoes and carrots pictured on the label. Um, so that is my vitamin C story. And again, we just gave her vitamin C. She went back to, actually, she went back to school and, and got her degree in nutrition. So um, <laughs> she's doing, she's doing very well. That's wonderful. But thanks for these very uh, illustrative stories. And I think, uh, as you said, we, 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 we always feel that nutritional deficiencies are, are not something we, we should should commonly see in our society, but but we actually do. And, and for many, many reasons, people might have to restrict the diets. So after having so much experience with this, do you have a specific panel of vitamins or micronutrients that you usually check? Or can you give us any advice in that regard? Sure. So, you know, it is a, it is an ever evolving list of things that I check. And I also, when we check levels, the question we, that we have to ask ourselves is what does that serum level actually say about the intracellular uh, level, right? So, and there is more and more work being done uh, in the biochemistry literature and the International Journal of Chemistry. It's helping us understand this. So, uh, we're, we're getting more data. For instance, 
the brain uses 100 times more vitamin C than any other tissue in the body, which is, again, new data for me uh, starting this year. So I'm now increasing the amount of vitamin C I'm giving people. So Linus Pauling was probably right. Um, but I do, I do, um, you know, all the ones that we typically do, right? So B1, uh, B12, folic acid, uh, B6. I also do vitamin B2. Um, we do uh, vitamin 25 hydroxy vitamin D, uh, vitamin E level, selenium, zinc, uh, copper. Those are sort of the the big ones. Um, and then, you know, I haven't, I'm working right now to figure out what is the best way to measure iodine. Um, I've seen a case of goiter and it, it, it related, I mean, it's really just um, cognitive decline uh, with thyroid deficiency. And the interesting thing, and I, this is a new subject for me to look into, we stopped using iodized salt. We are now looking at additive free salt, which means um, kosher salt or, or some other uh, Himalayan salt, sea salt. But iodine was added to salt for a very clear reason. And so when we're moving away from iodized salt, now I'm asking patients, oh my gosh, what kind of salt are you using? I never thought I'd be doing these things as a neurologist. But those are the main levels that I check. Um, you know, certainly uh, you can add uh, more more micronutrients as you need for your specific patient. But, and I, I also um, occasionally will check a biotin level and a niacin level, depending on what uh, the patient's particular diet or symptoms are. So that's what I'm doing right now. That's very helpful. Yeah, so let's shift gears a little bit. So how can we prevent these nutritional deficiencies in the first place, right? And there's been so much interest in preventive neurology, especially as it pertains to so common problems as uh, stroke and dementia. And uh, we, we were just talking, there's so many literature now coming out, but our ultra high processed food is, is uh, really related to increased risks for dementia and so on. So I'd be really uh, interested in hearing your perspective on that. Right. So we, you know, there's plenty of literature now uh, about ultra processed foods and those kinds of foods represent 75%, up to 75% of the products in our grocery stores. So it's very difficult for us as individuals and then our patients to try to get the best we can. And yet we go to the grocery store, gosh, you only 25% of that, uh, all the things in front of you are not ultra processed. It's difficult. So I think that also is contributing to things. We know ultra processed diets or diets rich in ultra processed foods are, uh, in, you have an increased risk of cognitive decline, dementia, stroke, actually all cause mortality, cancer. It's just really bad for you. Um, so I try really hard without frightening people that they cannot eat anything. Um, the biggest challenge is that food is actually good for you. How do I get you to eat real food, right? That's the first challenge in prevention. Um, so source really matters. So I focus a lot on nutrition. We have the MIND diet, the DASH diet. We have several dietary guidelines. Unfortunately, uh, the MIND diet, which is, you know, sort of a European Mediterranean diet, that doesn't translate very well to someone from Southeast Asia or Vietnam or North Africa, right? So um, the other thing that I try to do is get a sense of what my patients are actually eating. So I have them do a photo diary for about two weeks of everything that they eat. And then we try to enhance that. So whatever they're doing, we're trying to get a better source out of the grocery store, right? Into maybe a farmer's market or some place where the quality can be better. And, you know, this, we have to keep in mind also uh, access to good foods. Not everybody can uh, find good foods where they are. Um, so it, it is difficult, but you can always add a little bit, right? Whether it's whole grains, good dairy, um, we can do these things. We know that, um, a lot of work is happening right now about uh, the gut microbiome. And so good 
fermented foods, the little bits eaten every day. And I like a variety of things. I have my, for my patients, I have my fermented five, um, which is, uh, you know, fermented grain. And that, you know, lots of cultures have fermented grain. Um, in the European cultures, bread, so sourdough bread, normal bread, right? Bread that the idea of day old bread getting hard is because it's properly named. So there shouldn't be anything in bread other than good flour, uh, salt, water, and yeast. Um, you can add other things, I'm sure. But, and then other people, so in Ethiopia, they eat injera. There's, there are a lot of things in, in India, they have fermented pancakes called dosas. So lots of cultures use fermented products, um, kimchi, yogurt, all over the world, they use these things. So, um, so fermented, uh, grain, fermented dairy. So in the form of yogurt, kefir, lebne, whatever you would like, um, fermented fruit, a fermented vegetable and a fermented leaf, right? So if we try to incorporate some of these things from the grocery store, there's, there are lots of good companies doing cold fermentation. So the first approach to, to good nutrition is good sources, a wide variety of foods that are culturally relevant, right? That's what makes it um, easier for our patients. Um, that's, I think that's the, the biggest thing. I check levels of things. And, uh, for most of these micronutrients, I like to hold people at sort of high normal range, right? We don't want them, you know, we have a range of vitamin D of 30 to hundred. And we know out of the, the recent, uh, lovely, uh, paper on multiple sclerosis through the department of uh, defense data that, 80 to 100, you know, higher than 80 is sort of where we want our vitamin D levels. So we have good data that we can use um, biomarkers to help us with. Wonderful. But I love your approach, especially the very practical things of having people actually journal their food for you and, and look at that. I think that's very, very helpful. And, and uh, maybe we should all uh, really be more hands on with patients to help them to make those kind of transitions. So, um, yeah, I think this is wonderful. If anyone is looking for additional resources, practical advice on, on making these diet changes for patients, any additional resources you want to share? Um, I think, I think, um, there are, there are easy cookbooks, right? So, uh, and, and this is not just for patients, but it's for us as physicians, we are pretty, we are. We are, uh, we shortchange our lives and therefore we shortchange our nutrition. And regardless of everyone thinking that this is a very cognitive specialty, those of us who've been through residency training and see patients on a daily basis know that it is physically also demanding, right? So making sure that we are getting what we need is important. So, you know, eating well is important for us. Um, I think familiarizing yourself with things like the mind diet, maybe, you know, look at, um, a lot of their books by Michael Pollan that tell you about what's happening to food. Uh, that's really the way to get it started with this. Every association has a diet. So the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, uh, American Diabetes Association, everybody's got a diet, but no one diet fits all. So it's important to understand how to enrich and enhance away from ultra process what patients are doing and you know i wish there were shortcuts but there just aren't any um i tomorrow morning at eight o'clock i'll be meeting three of my patients at the farmer's market i tore them through the farmer's market because that's where i shop and um and i know this is impractical for most people but i've arrived at this place after 20 years of doing this. Um, but during that time, we will talk about everything, how to, how to buy, uh, small amounts of produce so you're not wasting things in the refrigerator. Um, there's a good, uh, like bring, you know, sort of a pickle vendor, uh, where do you get your meat? How do you get your eggs and become connected again with farmers, what's in local in your area. And basically I'm going to sound very crunchy canola, the earth again, right? So we were of the earth. And, you know, we've all been talking about this. We, we have more meds, medications available to us now. We have more food, 
quote unquote food available to us now, things to eat, calories available. And yet we are ever sicker. We are sicker now than we've ever been in a sea of calories and a sea of pharmaceuticals. And I think if we're going to look at prevention, we need to also look to ancient cultures. We are all here because their diets were good and allowed us to exist. Um, I just got back from Egypt 50,000 years ago. They were eating a balanced diet, some study of everything. So that's what I would like to encourage back to the past because it worked, right? It, it, it worked. And so, um, I think if neurologists can take just a little bit of time, doesn't take very long for somebody these days to create a food diary and you have an idea, a pictorial diary of what's going on and then start that conversation. I do the nutritional counseling myself um, just because I live in Houston and we have an incredibly, we have, we're the most uh, diverse, culturally diverse city in the country. And so I've learned all of these dishes, how to cook, how to prepare, and then how to change. But just starting that conversation of getting people away from ultra processed foods, if there's a farmer's market in your area, I think that's what I would ask people to do. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this great advice. And I absolutely love how you spread your knowledge in very small ways and large ways. I didn't mention the beginning. You are this year also the president of the Texas Neurologic Society. You do a lot of teaching and advocacy also for the American Academy of Neurology. So I think this is really wonderful advice. Thank you so much for sharing our new knowledge and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Catherine, thank you so much again for the opportunity. I hope this has been helpful and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.